Hey everybody, it's Monday, December 18th, 2023. Welcome to the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. It's me, your man, MG Marcus Grant, joined by Michael F. Florio. Specialist in the house, give yourselves a round of applause. Well, that's a very hungover sounding applause there. <laughs> it was a rough weekend, I guess, for the specialist. Uh, nonetheless, we did have a, uh, a specialist holiday party, which was a very good time. Uh, and uh, maybe, maybe people are still shaking that off. I have no idea. But we appreciate you guys helping us put this show on each and every day. We appreciate all of you out there for engaging with us, uh, whether it is audio, video, social media, what have you. All right. We are pretty much through the first week of the fantasy playoffs. One more game still to be played on Monday night between the Eagles and the Seahawks. Um, there were some really good things, some really big surprises, and some real big disappointments. How is your – you have a buy in a couple of leagues. I was going to ask you how you're doing, but you, you're like, you got the week off, basically. I, of my – there's six leagues that I really care about. Three had a buy, three had matchups, and if A.J. Brown gets me a yard tonight, literally one yard – all six would have made it to the semis. So I, I'm pretty happy right now. I like your chances. I'm just putting Fingers that out crossed. There. I like your <laughs> chances. That's all I'm saying. Uh, we got plenty to talk about on this show. The biggest takeaways, of course, from week 15, top performers, disappointments. We'll have some of your questions. And look, there's still season left to go. So Matt Okada is going to stop by with some waiver wire targets. Uh, but let's get going. As we always do with some fantasy headlines, and we'll start with one of the games that was played on Saturday. Jamar Chase in the Bengals win over Minnesota suffered an AC joint injury. According to our own Ian Rappaport, the Chase may not miss time. Head coach Zach Taylor says Jamar Chase is day to day. I mean, simple question probably has a simple answer. If Jamar Chase is playing, does this worry you at all? It, it adds more volatility to him because an injury is always something to so, some cause for concern, but with how good J uh, Browning is playing, it would still, I mean, I'm still playing Chase if he plays. If he sits, I think T. Higgins gets a big boost. If Chase plays, I think Higgins is still in play, but he becomes a little more volatile as well. Yeah, I mean, look, at this point in the season, you're not getting away from Jamar Chase. This, this isn't like one of those, I, we talked about Patrick Mahomes last week, right? And whether or not you're starting Patrick Mahomes because he hasn't been playing well. Like, Jamar Chase has been playing well. Yeah. There's no drama here. So if he's going, uh, he's going to get targets. Jake Brown is slinging, Jake Browning is slinging it. So uh, you're starting Jamar Chase pretty much regardless. Just as long as he's able to suit up and go, he's in your fantasy lineup. Uh, in New York, Zach Wilson left the Jets game against the Dolphins in the second quarter with a head injury that first wasn't being called a concussion, then it was. There's also some reports of dehydration. Uh, I mean, look, either way, it was an awful game for the Jets this past week. Let's just say Trevor Simeon starts. If Zach Wilson can't clear concussion protocol, can you play any of your Jets in that situation? It, it becomes really scary. Like, I was all set to write about Garrett Wilson as a start this week in the stardom sit -em, But if, because they play the commanders, the best matchup for passing attacks. But if he's, if it's Trevor Simeon, uh, it becomes really difficult to trust. I think Brees Hall, because of the matchup, you could still start. If Zach Wilson plays, not only do I think you could play Garrett Wilson, I think in super flex leagues, you could potentially stream that. Like, he might be my Justin Herbert replacement in a super flex this, this Ooh, week. Wow, that's spicy. Uh, look, I'm, I'm sticking with the same Jets you've been rolling with all year long, right? If you've been rocking with Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson, you continue rocking with Brees Hall and Garrett Wilson. I don't think it matters who the quarterback is. Those are really the only two playmakers they have in this offense. And whether it's been Zach Wilson, Tim Boyle, Trevor Simeon, they get the ball to those guys. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot more volatility involved. But if you have been rolling with Garrett Wilson, I think you keep rolling with Garrett Wilson. End of story. Uh, some unfortunate news out of Baltimore. Rookie running back Keaton Mitchell is going to miss the rest of the season. Suffered a knee injury in the game last night against the Jacksonville Jaguars. And really a... a Disappointing, frustrating, sad end to what was a really good rookie season for Keaton Mitchell. Got word that Melvin Gordon is going to be elevated to the active roster. You and I had both forgotten that Melvin Gordon <laughs> was in Baltimore. I I'm not going to ask you for picking up Melvin Gordon because I think we know the answer to that. But does this give, say, Justice Hill a little bit more value? Does this help Gus Edwards? Who picks up the slack here? I think we'll see Gus Edwards go back to being the lead runner. Like yesterday, it was Keaton Mitchell until he got hurt. and He was averaging over eight yards per carry yesterday. Uh, then Gus Edwards had 16 carries. The, the efficiency struggled. He scored a touchdown and still only managed to get you 12 
fantasy points. That being said, they get the 49ers next week. Gus Edwards doesn't have double-digit fantasy points in a game without a touchdown this season. I still think Gus Edwards is someone to avoid next week because the matchup against the Niners is so difficult. It is. I will say, I will say this. In a pinch... I could probably make a case for it. The Niners' run defense has been so-so. Uh, they actually give up a lot of yards on Sunday to James Conner and the Cardinals. But I think more of it is a volume play than necessarily a matchup-based play. So that makes me sort of worried. I do think Justice Hill starts to see some more opportunities, especially in the passing game, get a few more targets there. Um, but this this hurts, man, because Keaton Mitchell was playing some really good football. And uh, we'll see how serious the knee injury is, but obviously going to miss the rest of this year. And it becomes a question of how much into next season does he miss as well. Uh, staying in the division and going over to Pittsburgh, the Steelers offense, well, you see it's bad. Uh, and firing Matt Canada hasn't made it a whole lot better. On the weekend, uh, Kenny Pickett was injured. Mitch Trubisky got the start. Mitch Trubisky did not get the finish. Mason Rudolph took over at some point late in that ball game. And head coach Mike Tomlin has said it will be Mason Rudolph who starts against the Bengals this week. That has provided Kenny Pickett cannot go, which looks uh, very improbable. Um, Tomlin does say that Pickett has been improving, hasn't completely ruled him out, so we will see. But, I mean, Florio, as bad as this offense has been, especially if it's Mason Rudolph who gets the start, can you trust any Steelers this week? If you trust any of them, I think it's Deontay Johnson. They uh, they have played together, these two. Like, all these highlights you're seeing are from a couple of years ago for Mason Rudolph. George Pickens wasn't there. Like, it, like Deontay Johnson is the one that he has chemistry with. Johnson is the one they like to go to in the red zone. He has a touchdown and over 13 fantasy points in three straight. George Pickens is too boomer bust for me, and it, the volatility is through the roof right now. Uh, Fryer Muth is the same way. Najee Harris and, and Jalen Warren continue to eat off of each other's plate. I would try to avoid this offense outside of Deontay Johnson if possible. I would definitely avoid the pass catchers for sure. I, maybe it's because I just keep trying to make fetch happen. Is that I keep trying this rotation with Jalen Warren and Najee Harris, and I think the, the Bengals are vulnerable against the run. So that makes me believe that maybe one or both of those guys could have decent games. But in the end, if the offense can't move the ball, which is kind of what we saw this past weekend uh, against Indianapolis, then it may not actually matter. But uh, I, I just keep trying to tell myself the story and using this process of uh, the Steelers' bad passing game versus a bad, uh, uh, bad Bengals run defense and, and seeing whether or not Harris and or Warren I can be one of those guys, but very well could be wrong. The answer could be none of the above. We will find out. Um, those are the things we saw over the past weekend in the NFL. That gets us to the things we learned and our biggest takeaways from week 15. And I'm sure this first one uh, especially warms your heart, Florio. Uh, James Cook must start RB1. And yeah, I'm a Bills fan, but... Fantasy comes first, and me and Marcus have been talking to James Cook since July, June, whenever it's been. Uh, and, and it was a slow process early on, but 24 fantasy points per game in the last month since Joe Brady has taken over as the offensive coordinator. 36 fantasy points yesterday, over 200 yards, two touchdowns, should have been a third. We'll give him a pass, but he dropped a third touchdown. He was doing things that haven't been done by Bills running back since the 80s uh, and like must start RB status. And the thing is, all this, this 24 fantasy points per game has come against the Cowboys, the Eagles, the Chiefs, the Jets. Tough matchups on paper. Now he gets the Chargers who just gave up a billion points to the Raiders last week. Uh, not only is he a must start running back. James Cook just might mess around and win some people fantasy championships. He really might. I, I was looking at him. I mean, he's a solid RB1 for the rest of the playoffs. And now I'm thinking we're drafting him, what, high RB2 next year uh, when we get the fantasy drafts, as long as things don't really change again. Um, one thing I thought, we got Arthur Smith again this past week, right? We spent the last couple of weeks talking about how great it was that we're seeing Drake London get all these targets, that B. John Robinson is getting all these snaps and touches and looking really efficient. And we went into this weekend saying... Does this continue or do we get Arthur Smith again? I know on Friday, Stardom Sidham show, uh, Laquan Jones is like, there's no way, right? He's not going to do it to us again. He absolutely did it to us again. In a rainstorm against the worst team in the league, Tyler Algier had more touches than Bijan Robinson, Drake London, and Kyle Pitts combined. The Falcons go on to score seven points. They lose to the Carolina Panthers. 
you just continue to wonder how does this happen? How does this work that you spend three top 10 picks on three incredibly talented players and then you don't use any of them. This is a guy who's supposed to be an offensive-minded head coach. We sort of marveled with what he did in Tennessee all these years. I really thought I was over this because we hadn't done like a real Arthur Smith rant in several weeks. And all the negative bad feelings just came flooding back watching what happened. Where if you didn't know, maybe you thought maybe you thought that Bijan got hurt or something. I, you, you just couldn't figure it out. But no, it was Arthur Smith being Arthur Smith again. The worst thing that coaches do, Arthur, and, and don't call me biased against Arthur Smith because I was yelling at the Buffalo Bills coaching staff for doing this. Running backs know not to fumble. When they have a random fumble, it's not like they're doing it on purpose. So punishing them by taking your best playmaker off the field is only detrimental to your own team and hurting your own chances of winning. Bad coaches continue to do that. Sean McVay saw Kyron Williams fumble twice yesterday and was like, he's our best player. I'm not pulling him from the game. This ain't high school. It's not college, right? I mean, you give the, there's a reason you are counting on these guys. You give them a chance even when they make mistakes. Um, I just, I don't understand it. Uh, meanwhile, in Kansas City, we're finding some help for, for uh, Patrick Mahomes. It's definitely not Kadarius Tony. Yeah, I, I was on the Kadarius Tony hype train early on this season, and I quickly jumped off of it when I realized that they were using Rasheed Rice the way that I wanted them to use Kadarius Tony. And Rasheed Rice has blossomed into a must-start wide receiver one for fantasy football purposes. 92% of the snaps yesterday led the Chiefs in targets, catches, and yards. That has been a trend now for weeks, not just their receivers. He has been outproducing Travis Kelsey as of late as well. Uh, in the last four games for Rasheed Rice, eight catches per game, 84 yards per game, 20.4 fantasy points per game. He is their top go-to weapon right now. Uh, even if you want to say that Travis Kelsey is their number one pass catcher, Rasheed Rice is a must-start fantasy wide receiver one. Uh, don't even think twice about playing him the rest of the way. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's what it is, right? It's Travis Kelsey, it's Rasheed Rice. Everybody else is just kind of fighting for scraps in that passing game, and that's, that's all you got to worry about. Uh, the last thing that I learned from this past weekend is that Tommy DeVito's Lynn Sanity run uh, it might be over uh, at this point. Look, he's, he had started four games coming into this week. Uh, you know, he had played really, really well. He was the talk of the NFL, right? His agent was getting love, uh, rocking green suits on sidelines and that sort of thing. And then the Saints came, and they put extreme pressure on him. They just came up the middle. They came from the edges. They put him under duress all day long. He struggled getting the ball out. He struggled connecting with his receivers. Um, the next two weeks... He's got the Eagles and the Rams, and I know we've been picking on the Eagles for opposing passing games because their secondary has been a problem, but they do have guys up front that can get pressure yep. on the quarterback, and you wonder whether or not they're going to start bringing more blitzes, bringing more pressure. The Rams may want to do the same. I think what we saw from the Saints on Sunday might be the blueprint to slowing down Tommy DeVito, and so it's been a nice run. We all knew it was going to end at some point, and we might have seen the beginning of the end in Week 15. We are just seeing the beginning of the beginning of this show. We got plenty more to talk about. We'll do some top performers, some big disappointments. We'll have some of your questions and the waiver wire all coming up a little bit later on. Stick around for that on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. Looking at the top performers from week 15, still, of course, one game to go on Monday night, but uh, Jared Goff, the indoor cat, uh, got all cozy on the couch. The five touchdown passes, more than 31 fantasy points there. Christian McCaffrey doing Christian McCaffrey things. Uh, 115 rushing yards and a touchdown, 72 receiving yards and two more scores, nearly 42 points for CMC. Jordan Addison, where we thought maybe you should avoid him. Nope, nope. Six catches for a buck 11 and two tutties. That's almost 30 points for him. Sam Laporta continuing to ball out. Three touchdown passes against the Broncos. 28.6 points for him. Kaimi Fairbairn, four kicks, uh, four field goals and an extra point. That was 17 points. And the Raiders DST, who just obliterated Easton Stick and the Chargers, 25 fantasy points. Uh, I'm going against Josh Palmer and the, and the Raiders defense in one league. It was great to open up on Saturday morning and see that Ooh. I was down 45 points uh, already after just those two guys. Josh Palmer was just one broken play, too. That was it. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Uh, all right, let's talk some top performers, though. Some of the guys who maybe did not make that list that you just saw or that I just read. And uh, just when, you know, T. Higgins, man. Like, we weren't sure what to do with him, but apparently he's still in play. 
Yeah, I, I wanted to give him some love because that catch that he made on Saturday, the game-tying touchdown catch, arguably the touchdown catch of the year. He catches it, stays in bounds, manages to spin his body and arm around just to go over the plane. And the thing is, we know it's been a lost year for T. Higgins. Disappointing performances, injuries kept him on and off the field, but we still know that T. Higgins is one of the best talents in the league, and next week he gets a Steelers defense that kind of looks checked out as of late, so I think he's back in play in our fantasy lives. Not to mention that uh, T. Higgins' mother is out on Twitter just ethering <laughs> people. Like, um, yeah, it's... I don't know, you want to go look for it, you can go find it, but uh, T. Higgins' mom bringing heat to people who are criticizing her son. Uh, for me, it was Jalen Waddle who had a big game. We weren't sure what to expect with the Dolphins' offense, knowing that Tyreek Hill wasn't going to play. And it's just a reminder that Jalen Waddle on a lot of other teams could be a wide receiver one. He just happens to be stuck with like the wide receiver one <laughs> playing across from him this season. But he went out and balled eight catches, 142 yards, a long touchdown from Tua Tonga Vailoa against that very good Jets defense. So I, I know at times, especially early in the season, it was frustrating because T uh, because Tyreek Hill was eating. And Jalen Waddle wasn't, but uh, this is a reminder of why you spent a relatively high draft pick on him and what he can be for both the Dolphins offense and for your fantasy team. Meanwhile, another team that plays its home games in Florida. Uh, look, Baker Mayfield's playing good football. I don't. I have no jokes. That's that's all there is to it. <laughs> he, so for most of the year, Baker Mayfield has been a solid floor streaming quarterback, like 16 or more fantasy points in nine of his 14 games. That's about 65%, which is passing in New York City public schools. Um, <laughs> but the last two weeks, 20 or more fantasy points. Season high, 29 last week. Now he gets the Jaguars. Who've allowed a whole boatload of passing yards, touchdowns, fantasy points, two quarterbacks. I think Baker Mayfield is very much so in play this week, and he could get people into the fantasy championship perhaps because his weapons are great, the matchup is good, and he's going to have to put up points to keep up with the Jags offense. Yeah, I do think that's that's going to be in play. I actually do like him as a sleeper this week, so uh, good news there. Uh, I know it's been rough if you've had Terry McLaurin on your fantasy roster this year, right? You look around, Sam Howell is slinging it, putting up all these passing yards, and you got to figure, well, Terry McLaurin's eating, right? No. Uh, he actually went into week 15 with his lowest yards per game average of his career. And then halfway through the game, Sam Howell got benched. Jacoby Brissett came in there and was like, F it. Terry's down there somewhere. Just started heaving up YOLO balls to Terry McLaurin. He has uh, his best day of the season. Six catches for 141 yards. A touchdown. Very nearly had a second touchdown. Uh, was ruled down just short of the goal line. That's the good news. The frustrating news, though, is that the Commanders aren't turning away from Sam Howell, nor did I expect them to. They have nothing to play for this season. Why wouldn't you get your young quarterback some reps? They just decided to sit Howell down last week. So as fun as it was having Jacoby Brissett get Scary Terry involved, next week we go back to more of the same. And then, by the way, in week 17, they get the 49ers. So that's even more bad They get the Jets next news. week, too. Yeah, get, so it... You know, maybe it might have been your last hurrah for Terry McLaurin. Yeah, I, I think in in a lot of shallower leagues, I'm trying to get away from Terry next week. Yeah, I think that's I think that's sort of the way to go there. Uh, meanwhile, another wide receiver that we're used to seeing put up big points. Put up big points. Cooper Cup is back. I told you on Club Sud last week, this guy will get you 25 fantasy points. He almost got it on the nose. 25.1 got you that extra point of a that tenth of a point just to, for good measure. But 25 plus in two straight games, over 110 yards in two straight games, a touchdown in three straight. Cooper Cup is back. I know it, the beginning of the year he was out, then he hurt his ankle, and it was a bunch of down weeks. It doesn't matter. Cooper Cup, if you got to the playoffs with him, obviously you were starting him, but he might just be a league winner. Different way that we thought when we predicted this before the season, but he just might come through after all. I just think it's a reminder that, you know, like it takes guys time to heal. Even yes. when they're back on the field, doesn't mean they're 100%. It just means they're good enough to play. And I think we've seen Cooper Cup slowly get healthy as the season has gone along. Uh, my last one here is David Njoku. And I think we talked about him a little bit last week, but I just feel like... He hasn't gotten enough love for what he has done this season because even before this last stretch, the last two games have been amazing. 16 catches, 195 yards, three touchdowns over the last two games. He and Joe Flacco were working well. But even before that, 
he was doing enough to hang around in that tight end one range. Now it's him and Amari Cooper who were the top two targets in this Baltimore or this uh, Cleveland passing game, I should say. And at this point, I don't know how you get away from him for the remainder of the season, the next two weeks, because he and Joe Flacco are really clicking together. And I just feel like we need to give him some more attention for what he's been doing this year because we talk about some of the top tight ends in fantasy. His name just hasn't been involved in the conversation, and it probably should have been. Yeah. So, so there it is. David Njoku, the chief, uh, doing big things over the last couple of weeks. So those are the guys who uh, made us feel great. How about the guys who made us feel terrible? And um, try to say this without a big smile on your face because it happened against your team. Dak Prescott. If you have Dak Prescott and you manage to survive the week, you should celebrate. Because as of right now, with the Monday Night Football still to go, he is the QB 30 on the week. Every single starting quarterback outside of Zach Wilson, who left immediately, outscored Dak Prescott. Two Washington Commanders quarterbacks outscored him. Uh, Bailey Zappi, Bryce Young, Desmond Ritter. The list goes on. It, it was br a brutal day for Dak Prescott. And the thing is... We could be like, all right, we know to start Dak at home, obviously. On the road, maybe you get away from him. Next week, they play the Dolphins. I, I think you just keep riding with Dak Prescott because then he gets to the Lions at home. So I know a lot of you probably looked at the schedule and thought Dak's going to win me championships. Hopefully you survived this past week because he still can. But yeah, you needed some other players to step up in a big way if you had Dak. Yeah, you absolutely did. Uh, it was just a bad game all around for the Cowboys. It was also a bad game all around for the Tennessee Titans, who um, they were a hoist on their own petard. They had the hubris to wear the Houston Oilers uniforms against the Houston Texans, and I think karma came back to bite them. But on top of it, uh, Derrick Henry just completely shut down. 16 carries for just nine yards, four targets, four catches for one yard. He had nine total, he had the, what, 10 total yards in that game. First player in NFL history to have at least 20 touches and produce less than 15 yards from scrimmage. Uh, that was per Ryan McDowell, uh, who does a lot of great work. Uh, you should go follow him, Ryan McDowell 23 uh, on the Twitter machine, but uh, a, an awful, awful day. The Titans get bumped out of playoff contention, so their season is in effect over. And now you got Derrick Henry sort of pondering his future. I would imagine these next few games are the last ones we see with him in a Tennessee Titans slash Houston Oilers uniform. Uh, was very surprised that they didn't trade him closer to the dead. I know we 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 talked about that. I was surprised they didn't try to trade him, but I guess they were still hanging around. Him, him and D Hop. But th that being said. I, like Henry, uh, who does he get next week? They get the Seahawks. I, I still think you got to stick with them. Yeah, that's true. There's another there's another chance for him to bounce back with the uh, against that Seahawks run defense. But um, I knew there was a, a chance that it was going to be bad. I didn't think it would be that no, bad. The, Henry has gone for over 150 yards. I think it is in like four of their last five games against the Texans. No team has ever wanted to stop him more than Houston did yesterday. Yeah, so that's probably very, very true. Uh, all right, let's get to some of your questions that the, you sent to us uh, at NFL Fantasy on Twitter. And the first one comes from Sean, who asks, do I start Brock Purdy Ooh. or Lamar Jackson next week? Two top quarterbacks who are facing each other going against very good defenses. What do you do here? That is the final game of the week two next week on Christmas night. Um... Ask me again later in the week, but as of right now, I'm leaning Lamar because two tough defenses. Lamar gives you points with his legs, but I, can anyone slow down that 49ers off? I, I'll probably go Purdy, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I'm going to go Purdy. He's not going to run, obviously, yeah. as much as Lamar, but the way he's spreading the ball out, uh, I think four, yeah, four touchdown passes, so many weapons there. Uh, I think top to bottom, the Niner offense is more stacked than the Ravens, so I'm going to go with Brock Purdy there. Uh, our next one comes from Coach Tony, who asks Justin Fields against the Cardinals or Jordan Love against the Panthers next week. I'm going to go with Justin Fields there. Not only will Fields get it done on the ground, uh, he'll also throw the ball. The Cardinals defense is very, very porous right now. But Jordan Love, I, I think the Packers could run on the Panthers in this one. I do think the Packers can run. I actually like Aaron Jones a lot yes. for the Packers, which maybe means not so much Jordan Love. I'm going Justin Fields all yeah, the way against same. Arizona. Uh, next one from Seth wants to know, Baker, who we just talked about, or Kyler versus the Bears this week? Is it crazy to say Baker? Because no. the Bears defense deserves credit. They have been 
playing awesome the last six, seven weeks. And so of the two Oklahoma quarterbacks here, I might go with the first one that won the Heisman. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going Baker Mayfield against the Jaguars. I like him as a sleeper this week. I was worried about Joe Flacco against the Bears. He actually had 374 yards uh, and a couple touchdowns, but he also threw three picks. So yeah, uh, I like Baker more. This one from Jason is Devin Singletary startable now. It looks that way. It's been back and forth with this backfield, but he dominated volume yesterday. Damian Pierce is a waiver wire guy now. Uh, Singletary, there's always a little volatility because what if the, the goal line carry goes to Pierce, but I think you could start him. Uh, yeah, I guess you could start him in deeper leagues. I'm not excited about it because he could very go back, very well go back to giving you like 40 yards next week or something like that. So we'll see. But for now, he's startable. Uh, last one from Clark. What should I do about Austin Eckler? Clark, you might be the last Austin Eckler manager still standing. You really might be. <laughs> um, I I still think you start him. Like, the Bills, I know, that just shut down the Cowboys and stuff. It'll be a road game. They, they are very banged up on defense, and they struggle against pass catching backs. I was surprised Tony Pollard wasn't thrown two more yesterday. Yeah, I think you still roll with him. Um, but I get it, man. It's bleak. It's scary. And the fact that you survived this long, uh, pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> with Austin Ecker, considering how little he gave you, especially how little he gave you on Thursday night. We're going to dive into some waiver wire picks because those of you still playing could probably use some help to bolster your roster. So Matt Okada will stop by to talk about that as we get to some more here on the NFL Fantasy Football Show. It's time for the waiver wire presented by YouTube TV list of waiver wire targets put together by our own Matt Okada starting at quarterback Jake Browning who has been red hot going against the Steelers then you got Joe Flacco he of the 374 passing yards this past week taking on the Houston Texans Baker Mayfield who we've spoken about a lot on this show today he's got the Jaguars Gardner Minshew heading down to Atlanta to take on the Falcons and Jacoby Brissett uh, likely going to be Sam Howell starting but just in case Brissett could be a nice pickup going against the Jetropolitans. Meanwhile, some running back targets. Ty Chandler, who looked very good this weekend, uh, going against the Lions. Amir White, at least as an insurance play, if J uh, Josh Jacobs can come back. They're facing the Chiefs. Ty J Spears going against the bad Seahawks run defense. Rico Dowdle uh, on to Miami is a nice handcuff to Tony Pollard. Chase Brown getting a lot more opportunities for the Bengals going against the Steelers. Trey Sermon, a nice add, especially if Zach Moss can't go this week against the Falcons. Rashawn Johnson and what's become a three-headed backfield in Chicago. Then a pair of commanders with Antonio Gibson and Chris Rodriguez. Finally, we got some pass catchers for you. Josh Palmer had the one big play against the Raiders. That's all it took to have a good fantasy day. He's got the Bills this week. Noah Brown, who's been playing some good football. He's taking on the Cleveland Browns. Curtis Samuel had a touchdown on Sunday for the Commanders. He's got the Jets this week. Demarcus Robinson has been a touchdown machine lately, taking on the Saints. That is a Thursday night game. And then a couple of tight ends. Hunter Henry against the Broncos and Isaiah Likely against the 49ers. So joining us now, as always about this time, it's Matt Okada. You can uh, check him out on Twitter, at Matt Okada. You can also check out his waiver wire column at NFL.com slash waiver wire. So here we are. Uh, it is week two. I, I woke up this morning, Matt, thinking to myself, like, I'm old enough to remember when this would have been championship week, but we still got one more week to go uh, because uh, week 18 is still on the horizon. But uh, let's talk some quarterbacks because... We talk about revenge games a lot, and maybe we don't always use the term correctly, but Jake Browning against the Vikings was legitimately a revenge game. I mean, afterwards, he was like, you shouldn't have bleeping cut me. Uh, <laughs> dude's been on fire at this point. He seems like a really good streaming option for people. Yeah, he, he was letting them know after that <laughs> win. Uh, listen, we can all pretend that Jake Browning isn't playing better football than Joe Burrow was in an injury-marred season, but... We'd be pretending because he's playing better football than almost everybody in the NFL. As a starter, he is averaging 295 yards per game with a 76% completion rate, 9.1 yards per attempt, and a 109 passer rating. Those numbers would rank first, first, second, and second, each of those behind only Brock Purdy, among all qualified quarterbacks on the season. And even with just 12 fantasy points in his debut start, Browning has averaged 20.3 per game as the starter over this past month. Listen, the other shoe could eventually drop, but I see no evidence that it will. He has great pass catchers. He's got a great offense. And I think we have to consider him a legitimate starter 
until something changes, which I don't necessarily see happening. By the way, the Steelers defense he gets next week, they just allowed 20.9 fantasy points to Bailey Zappi and 20.6 to Gardner Minshew. So it feels like Browning is more or less guaranteed for a 20-burger this Saturday. Speaking of 20 burgers on Saturdays, Ty Chandler, and he's not available in a lot of my leagues because he was in my starting lineup last week, but uh, Okada, should people be rushing to pick him up, and do you think he could take the job away from Alexander Madison? Yeah, it's an interesting one with Ty Chandler, only rostered in 28% of NFL.com leagues, and that's because we didn't really know what to expect in his starting debut with Alexander Madison out after the team tried their darndest to avoid that reality all season. I have no idea why they did, because he took 26 touches for 157 yards, a goal line touchdown, and 25 fantasy points. He was efficient and explosive, which are two words rarely used of Alexander Madison this season. And it was all against what has been a solid defensive front. Next week, they get the Lions, who are even tougher against running backs, and we don't know whether Madison returns. But to your point, I think Chandler is a must-add anyway, and I think there is a non-zero chance that if Kevin O'Connell and company are watching the same tape I am, Chandler just keeps the starting job moving forward because he has looked better than Madison frequently. I think he will be in line for 20-plus touches if Madison does sit, which makes him a locked and loaded start. If Madison's back, it becomes a little bit more of a fringe flex play. Watch the news from beat reporters. The Vikings have been telling us that they don't want Alexander Madison to be the guy. I mean, that's why they added Cam Akers. Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Ty Chandler gives them another excuse to sort of move Madison out of that role. It's been fun if you have Chase Brown, I guess. Not so much if you have Joe Mixon because he's stealing work and looking really good doing so. But how do you feel about the Bengals running back? Yeah, I have mixed feelings that Chase Brown is simultaneously one of the most exciting and most frustrating options in fantasy right now, very much a la Keaton Mitchell, hope he gets better, and Devon Achan this year, in that he has consistently shown he could have an elite RB1 ceiling with a full workload because of how electric he is, but he is instead playing change of pace to a, quote, reliable early down quote plotter i use those two terms loosely because joe mixon gus edwards and raheem Mostert have all been quite solid in their own but the tough part with brown is that i don't necessarily expect his role to change that much from what we've seen these past couple weeks which have been growing so that's nice but the Bengals have had great success with this split this past saturday he had 10 touches to mixon's 13 in that overtime win he's averaging 6.6 .6 yards per touch which makes it a lot easier to deal with that low volume count. And he's always a threat to break a huge touchdown. I think his explosiveness, explosiveness makes him a viable pl flex play, regardless of the workload concerns. And for one more week, at least, he holds massive handcuff value should anything happen to Mixon. You're still starting Mixon, by the way, but I think Chase Brown is in play if you are if you came with a zero RB strat and made it to the semifinals. If you've lost a guy recently, you could definitely do worse than Chase Brown. Uh, meanwhile, in Los Angeles, uh, it's it's all over but the crying for the Chargers this year. But Josh Palmer came back, caught a long touchdown, and uh, I think we're just we're chasing chasing the upside there uh, with Easton Stick at quarterback. Yeah, we are. It would be a lot nicer if we had Justin Herbert. But look, in what was otherwise one of the ugliest performances we've ever seen by an NFL football team, Joshua Palmer still stepped up big for fantasy manager, managers on Thursday Night Football. With Keenan Allen out, he led the team with 113 yards and that long touchdown you mentioned. Only four catches, which also came on only four targets, which is kind of baffling considering the game state for this entire game, as we've all seen. Uh, but I guess wasn't what well, wasn't baffling about LA in that game. Listen, in four games that Palmer has played 70 plus percent of the snaps this year, he's averaged 6.5 targets and 96 receiving yards per game. And in the last two such games, including this past Thursday, he topped 110 yards and 18 fantasy points in both. I'd expect a whole lot more of that recipe against the Bills on Saturday, even with Keenan Allen likely back on the field. And with any luck, the Bolts will get that kind of scientifically proven new coach bump thing that happens for very little explicable reason, except that people are really tired of the old guy. In this case, Brandon Staley, who was finally fired. Maybe we get a little fun from the Chargers and Easton Stick. Joshua Palmer this coming weekend. I think he's a locked and loaded flex play and has wide receiver two upside. Speaking of 
upside. It didn't matter that no C.J. Stroud, Nico Collins, all of that. Noah Brown went off this week. C.J. Stroud could potentially be back. Nico Collins we have to monitor. But, Okada, it's a tough matchup against the Browns. Uh, do you think we could not, not only pick up Noah Brown? Should he be started this week? Yeah, it's, it's going to be close. What we've learned over the course of this year is that the Texans wide receiver one position might be one of the most lucrative in fantasy. And we saw that this past Sunday with what you just described, Noah Brown's uh, blow up game. It's been Tank Dell earlier in the year. It's been Nico Collins with Tank out. You're seemingly guaranteed to get a top 10 wide out on the week from Houston's go-to guy. For Brown, it was 22 fantasy points on eight catches for 82 yards and a score on 11 targets. And all of that was from Case Keenum rather than CJ Stroud. Now, Nico Collins participated in a pregame workout on Sunday and he seemed to be almost good to go. So I would expect he's back atop the depth chart this next week against the Browns. But I'd also lean towards the likelihood that Stroud clears concussion protocol ahead of that contest and is back. And he elevates the number two spot massively and I believe does keep Noah Brown in the starter conversation, even in a tougher matchup. I think he's a flex play for sure. And if you make it through the semis, whether Brown is in your lineup or not, they get the Titans in the fantasy championship who are much softer against wideouts. And I think Brown becomes a league winning proposition there. Yeah, I mean, I know we were sort of worried about Case Keenum, but I mean, we weren't starting Case Keenum. We just needed him to throw the ball downfield, and that's exactly what he did, and Noah Brown was the recipient of that. Uh, last one is Isaiah Likely. I mean, we we loved him once Mark Andrews went down. I mean, there are people that were on him as a sleeper even before Andrews got hurt. Uh, I would say, like, worry about the matchup, but I guess the volume sort of outweighs the matchup against the 49ers next week. I think it does. It's really the biggest key with tight ends, especially streamer or waiver wire tight ends. And I, and I think we, have been begging you to add Isaiah Likely since Andrews went down with that season-ending injury. Somehow, he's still just 25% rostered in NFL.com leagues. I don't understand. This is nonsense. Silly goose behavior. So, to make things <laughs> easy, here's the list of guys you're definitely not benching for Likely in Week 16. Travis Kelsey, TJ Hawkinson, Sam Laporta, and Trey McBride. Those are the elite. Doesn't matter the matchup. You're putting them out there. I think that's it as far as definitely not ahead of likely. The next group of guys are kind of, I think, in a tier with likely. That's your Evan Ingrams, George Kittles, Jake Ferguson's, Dalton Kincaid's. And I think there's a decent argument to be made that likely should be started around or ahead of many of those names. He had six targets, five catches, 70 yards on Sunday Night Football, all led the Ravens. He's had 18 plus fantasy points in consecutive weeks. I think he's Lamar Jackson, the most reliable target right now. If you don't have one of those elite four, you should add likely and consider him as your starter. And if you stream your way to the semis, I think he's absolutely your best bet, even in a tough matchup. Yeah, I mean, we've been saying this for a while. Pick up Isaiah Likely. Why people haven't listened, I do not know. But for those of you who did, congratulations. Uh, anyway, uh, Matt Okada, you can go check him out at Twitter, at Matt Okada. You also go check out the waiver wire column, NFL.com slash waiver wire. Matt, appreciate you, sir. All right. There you go. Matt Okada with his waiver wire stuff. For those of you still playing, definitely go check out the waiver wire. Check out the article and then go pick up some guys, too. Uh, in the meantime, that is it. We are done. We appreciate you hanging out with the NFL Fantasy Football Show presented by Subway. You know the drill. Tell two friends to tell two friends. Rate, review, and remember, if you think air is free, try buying a bag of chips. Be safe. Take care <laughs> of yourselves. And we'll talk to you again real soon.